So if you have your Bible, I'd like you to turn with me again to John chapter 12. Um, And we're going to just go through the passage quietly. There's quite a number of things which I think the Lord has impressed upon my heart in this passage. You'll notice that it begins in verse 1. Uh, when six, when Jesus six, then Jesus six days before the Passover came to Bethany. Now Bethany was the home where the Lord Jesus was probably most welcome. It was a home where probably the father and mother had died. They're certainly not mentioned, and we have a brother and two sisters who are living in the family home. And it's Mary and Martha that are the sisters, and Lazarus that is the brother. Um, and it's, this is the Lazarus that the Lord Jesus had just raised from the dead. And um, they make a supper for him, and Martha serves, and Lazarus is one of those that sits at table with him. Now, <clears throat> what's very interesting is that in those days... Supper always occurred after sunset. It was always an evening meal, always occurred in the night. And it was a meal that people invited you to if they wanted you to stay. If they wanted you to stay and talk and have fellowship and laugh and and sew together, that was what they invited you to supper. However, there were other meals in the day. There was breakfast. We all know when breakfast takes place. And uh, there was also a midday meal, which was called dinner, that was a horrid affair. It was a brief time, probably less than an hour, and they just hurriedly had a meal together. You weren't expected to stay if somebody invited you for dinner, because there was an afternoon of work to do. So the meal was generally hurried. And you'll notice in the Gospels that when... um, A Pharisee wanted to have a very close look at the Lord Jesus and listen to him on a personal basis. He invited him to dinner because he wasn't expecting Jesus to stay. He just wanted to listen to a little bit about what he had to say. He wanted to see him at close quarters. However, this family invite the Lord Jesus to supper. Okay, And the supper was... A, a, a meal for people that you love. Got that? It's a meal for people that you want to spend time with. And it's a meal amongst people in, in, in close fellowship with one another. So, you can imagine how they felt about the Lord Jesus. They invited the Lord Jesus to supper. And just this morning, we've had the Lord's Supper, haven't we? We call it the Lord's Supper or communion, but we don't call it breakfast (coughs) and we don't call it dinner. We call it supper. And the reason why it's supper is because we come because we're invited. We come because we love the Lord Jesus. We come because we want to be with him, listen to him and be in close quarters with him. So this little family then invite the Lord Jesus to supper you'll notice that each of the three people in the home had three different things that they wanted to do you'll notice that Martha served now she was a busy person in another place it tells us about all the serving that she did and she was overwhelmed by it all in fact she told the Lord Jesus to go and tell Mary to help her Uh, whatever we might think of that Um, The important thing is Martha may have been the eldest in the family and she felt the duty and the responsibility to serve. So Martha served. Lazarus was one of those who sat or, or the word should be he reclined at the table because the custom in those days was to have a low table and lots of cushions all around it and you reclined on one of the cushions next to the table. Um. And then we read in verse 3, this is the actual heart of the passage. This is the bit where I want us to really think and imagine and think about what really took place here. Um, Mary took a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly. You'll notice that this ointment is, is measured not by its volume, 
It's measured by its weight. And the very interesting thing about this ointment was that it was very costly. Very costly indeed. You may be wondering, well, why would a woman have access to something so expensive like this? Now, what we have to bear in mind is that in those days, the general population in Israel were very poor. Now, that didn't mean that there wasn't money about. Herod was fabulously wealthy. So wealthy, in fact, that he would put some of the top most wealthy people in this world uh, into the shade if he was living today. Apparently, it's said, that about half of the gross natural product of the whole country came to Herod. That's a lot of money, a lot of wealth. And of course this was then passed on down through the, through the family over the years. This is why Herod the Great had such huge resources available to him to be able to um, do the great building projects that he did. He did huge building projects. But the common people were very poor in comparison. In comparison to all poor people in all the ages. They were, all, they were always very poor. What was paid to the, to the working man, even if he was completely in his own business, self-employed we would say today, was still very low wages. Um, that just happens to be what the economy was like. So we might say to ourselves, how did Mary get available to her some ointment, which it's called, which it really was like a, a, a perfume, we would call it today, a thick perfume, not a, a thin perfume. Um, how would you get a, available to him? What, what I'm going to suggest is that this ointment was something that was purchased out of money that she put aside for a future husband. All her life, all her life, she would save for the one that she would one day meet, for the one that would steal her heart, for the one that she would marry. And it was the custom that on the, on the wedding night, she would anoint her husband with this perfume. So she had this one treasure now, when Judas is talking about it, he says it could have been sold for 300 pence. Now, we know that in those days, the penny was on average the wage of a working man for one day. Now, whatever we think about the work, wage of a working man for one day today, we're talking about nearly a year's wages now, I'm trying to imagine what a working man's wage is for today. Let's suppose that a year's wages for a working man is, say, £15,000, £20,000. It's about right, isn't it? £17,000 would be a good figure. Imagine having some ointment in a bottle that weighs a pound in weight and is worth £17,000. That's a lot of money, isn't it? What was she going to do with it? Was she going to carry on waiting? No, no, no. The Lord Jesus had said so many times to the disciples that he was going to be crucified. He was going to be rejected. He was going to be crucified and he would rise again. So she comes to the Lord Jesus and it says that she was, uh, she came behind him um, and she took the ointment and she anointed his feet. Notice that. Now there's another anointment in the Gospels which takes place a little bit later in the week. And that's from an unknown woman. And she anoints the Lord's head. Okay? That was the night before the Lord Jesus died. This occurs six days before the Passover, so a totally different event, and all the details are different. And this time, it's Mary. It's Mary. Uh, not Mary, the mother of the Lord, or it's Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus. And she takes this ointment, and she pours it on his feet, and she wipes his feet with her hair, and the house, you can imagine, can't you? The house was filled with the odour 
of the ointment. Um, this was for Mary the greatest act of worship of her life. I mean, the word worship in the Bible means to bow upon your knees. That's what worship means. It means to get down on the floor before the Lord Jesus. That's what worship means. Anybody that prostrates themselves before another person is worshipping them. And that's what she did. She knelt down on the floor in front of all the other people in the house. And she, I think the idea is she broke it and she poured it on his feet. And the odour filled the whole room. It wouldn't be necessary to tell you, would it, how much she loved him. Don't need to tell you that. In fact, we couldn't even use any words, could we, to uh, describe her love and her devotion for him. What's interesting, though, is this, is that she gets severely criticised for it. That's interesting. You would have thought that all the people in the house would have been humbled in seeing that. But uh, she gets criticised. I get the impression from the other Gospels, that some of the other disciples were also cross, but in particular Judas is cross. You see, her devotion was her greatest act of, of, of adoration to the Lord Jesus. But her greatest act of adoration to the Lord Jesus was the greatest um, insult, as it were, to Judas. You see, Judas was money mad. Judas kept the bag and he used to like to put his hand in the bag and help himself to it and, and spend it on himself or eat it or whatever he did with it. So Judas was all take. Got it? Whereas this dear woman, Mary, was all give. She gave the most precious thing that she had in her possession. <coughs> And she gave it all, without any hesitation. If you'd have said to Mary at a later date, do you, have, do you regret that? Oh, no, 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 don't regret it at all. Not in the slightest. Mary never re regretted this, ever. She's just glad that she had an opportunity to give it all to him. And Judas, he says, well, why couldn't this ointment have been sold and given to the poor? <laughs> But John is very careful in what he writes here. He says this. He says he said this not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and he had the bag and he bore what's put therein. What did Jesus say? He said, leave it alone. And I think he said it in that tone. Leave it alone. Don't, don't do that. This this word from Judas was spoiling the whole event. This was an act of the utmost worship for this dear woman. And joy, Judas had to go and spoil it by talking about how much it's worth in human monetary terms. Shocking, isn't it? And Jesus says, he says, leave it alone. Against the day of my burial, she kept this. Against the day of my burial. This was something that was supposed to be devoted to the man of her life. But she has never met him yet. But she's met a man in her life, the Lord Jesus. And she's not going to marry him. But she'll never meet a man like that again. And she's going to give it all to him. She kept it for the day of my burial. And the Lord Jesus says, he says, the poor you will always have with you. Now this isn't an excuse for governments to not help the poor. Far from it. However he does say that the poor you will always have with you. But me you won't always have with me, with you anymore. And much, much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there. And they came not just to see Jesus. They came that they might see Lazarus. It's not, very, it's not every day that you go to see a person that's been raised from the dead is it? Eh? I don't suppose any of us here have ever done that. 
They came just to see Jesus, but they also came to see Lazarus, who, whom he had raised from the dead. Notice what it says in verse 10. It says, the chief priests consulted how they might put Lazarus to death. You might say, how terrible. This is a man that died. This is a man that got ill. This is a man that died before the Lord Jesus got there. And Christ raised him from the dead. And what are they are going to do? They are going to kill him? If ever you would need a definition of wickedness, that would be it, wouldn't it? What possible reason do these murderers have to kill a man? Just the fact that Jesus had raised him, that was enough for them. Terrible. Shocking. Beyond belief. They consulted how they might put Lazarus to death because that by reason of Lazarus, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. I find it quite thrilling, even in a late passage in the Gospels like this, that there are people that are still coming to the Lord Jesus. Uh, it says in another, another passage how that there was a great number of the priests and a great number of the scribes that were coming to Jesus and believing in him. Amazing. You would have thought that at this time in his ministry, people were falling off. But they weren't. They were still coming. And they were still coming to believe in him. Now from verse 12 on, we have the incident of Palm Sunday. On the next day, much people were come to the feast. And when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took palm branches and they went forth to meet him and cried, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Sorry, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat on it, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. Now notice this next verse. We need to notice do you know, I'm, I'm, I'm always amazed with the Bible. You can read the Bible all your life. And I've been reading John's Gospel all my life. But there's verses I've missed. Or verses I've read, but it hasn't sunk in. Notice what it says. These things understood not his disciples at the first. But when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him. And that they had done these things unto him. I sometimes wonder whether the disciples were in a sort of a bit of a dream and that they were doing things inspired of the Holy Spirit but didn't really understand what it was they were doing. I mean, they stood in the street and they followed the Lord Jesus and they said, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And yet John says this. He says, and do you know what? He says, none of us knew what we were talking about. We didn't have a clue. That's quite astounding, isn't it? You see, at this particular time, you wouldn't really call them Christians. They were just disciples of a Jewish rabbi. They didn't believe in the cross. Far from it. They didn't want the cross to happen. If you'd have said to any of these disciples at this time, do you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins? They'd say, no, we don't want the cross. We don't want the cross. In fact, Peter had the temerity to stand up to the Lord Jesus and tell him off for talking about it. And in another gospel we read that they understood not what he said. But they were people that were learning. They were learning. But they were at this stage frightened to death. They, In fact, it says that they stopped asking him questions. I think the reason why they stopped asking him questions is because they were frightened. That the questions that they might ask would be confirmed to be true. And they didn't want him to die. Certainly didn't believe in that. Um, and notice in verse 17 the people therefore that were with him when he called Lazarus out of the grave and raised him from the dead bear record for this cause the people also met him these people also met him for they had heard that he had done the, this miracle so not only were the disciples the people that were waving the palm branches but there were the people that had heard of Lazarus's resurrection 
they came also to join in and they joined in with the Palm Sunday celebrations. And uh, the Pharisees in verse, verse 19, it says, The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Do you perceive how that we prevail nothing? Behold, the whole world is gone after him. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Can we say praise the Lord that the whole world went after him? If they hadn't have done, you know, where would we be in England today? The whole world did go after him. They did believe in him. And there's a few other things I want to bring to your attention, but I'm just going to stick to just one more now. The time is moving on. It's a little incident that you may not have even known about. We read it in verse, um, well, starting in verse 27. Let me read there for you. It says, Christ says, Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause I came. To this hour you see the Lord Jesus was having a discussion with his father about going to the cross and he says um, should I say to the father save me from this hour but he says but for this cause I came to this hour the Lord Jesus didn't want to die this is something we need to get a grip of even in the garden of Gethsemane he says if it is possible let this cup pass from me Nevertheless, not my will but thine be done. And then, the, and then he says to the Father, he says, Father, glorify thy name. Now notice this. There came a voice from heaven saying, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. Do you know in the Bible there are not many voices from heaven? I remember a person said to me in the street one day, he said, if I heard a voice from heaven, I'd believe. I said, no, you wouldn't. You wouldn't because you wouldn't make any difference to you because you don't believe anyway. In the Bible, there are very few times when God speaks from heaven. Twice he says, this is my beloved son. But here we have another one. It's after the Lord Jesus says, Father, Glorify thy name. And the voice comes from heaven. I have glorified it. And I will glorify it again. Now notice something else it says. It says the people therefore that stood around and heard it said that it thundered. And others said an angel spoke. But obviously the disciples could understand the words. Do you know there's a common misconception amongst us Christians? We all have heard about the still small voice. That, that phrase, the still small voice in the English translations, is where the translator fell asleep. Because the Hebrew means a thundering, deafening noise. doesn't mean a still small voice. And we can go right through the Bible and whenever we hear that God speaks, it's always a thunder. Always. When, when, when John is in Revelation and he hears behind him a voice, he says it's like the voice of the many waters. In other words, it's like standing next to the Niagara Falls and you can't hear yourself think. It's so loud. That is the voice of God. That is what the people heard. But the amazing thing is this, is that the Lord Jesus says to his father, he says, Father, glorify thy name. And immediately the father answers and he says, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. I want to finish with a little, um, a little sort of um, illustration not related to what I've been saying but it's something that's been on my mind the past two or three days and I've been thinking about it each morning I'll, you'll see why in a moment we have a cat I've mentioned her before um, <clears throat> she creeps into the pulpit quite a lot here doesn't she um, every morning early in the morning Ruth will tell you we hear patter patter of feet into the, into the room and she'll stand at the side of my bed and she'll go yeah. And I shall say to her, what? 
and she'll look at me and if I pat her on the head she jumps up on the bed and she wiggles herself into a nice ball next to me she wants to get warm also um, she does something else which is very touching by the way she's quite annoying too if you want to sleep in I have to say Ruth has got, to the, into the, got her into the understanding now if you say shh she goes away so that's great we, we, we can do that now but um, she also does another thing if I'm not touching her stroking it or something like that she'll reach out with her paw and she'll just, she'll just touch, no claws she'll just touch me just to remind me like I'm here and I want you to touch me and of course the ultimate objective of all that she does is that we might get out of bed and go down and give her some food once we've given her food she's not interested in us not it. She just she just goes and lives her life. She goes off in the garden. She does whatever she feels like doing. The particular point I wanted what what's come to me about this is this is our relationship with the Lord every morning. <coughs> I wonder whether when we wake up in the morning, we just come before the Lord and we say, Lord. And we say it a number of times until he answers us, until we feel that he's listening. And then, do we then immediately jump into his arms to get warm? Just like the cat does, she wants to get warm. And we just put ourselves into his arms in order that we might know his arms around us. And notice also that little bit where she puts her paw out to touch me because she's asking me to touch her. And I sometimes wonder whether in the morning when we wake up that we put our hands out to him so that he might put his hand out to us. See the point. And it's all with the objection. It's all with the objective, sorry. The objective is that we might be fed. That we might be fed. And my um, encouragement to you today is this, is that when you rise in the morning, you, you call out to the Lord. You might put your hand out to the Lord, but more important, you put your hand out to the Lord in order that he might feed you. He might feed you. I don't know what you're like in your personal life, but I hope that you take hold of the, the scriptures every day. And you come to it and you say, Lord, speak to me today. Tell me something. It may be something to learn. It might be a challenge. It might just be some thoughts about the Lord Jesus. I don't really know what it would be for you. I know it's always different for me every day. But the important thing is that every day, just like my cat looks to me for food, so we all come before the Lord. And we say, Lord, feed me. Feed me. Give me something. Something that's going to feed my soul. We talked earlier, didn't we, about worship. How that on a Sunday morning, worship is difficult if it's not already our heart experience every day. So let's, in the morning, when we rise, let's call out to him. Let's put out our hand to him. Let's look to him to feed us. And let's do that on a Monday. And let's do it again on a Tuesday. And then again on a Wednesday. And when we come together on a Sunday, what a glorious time of fellowship we will have together. So there we are. There's a few thoughts. Um, and I thought I would share that with regard to my cat.